Welcome to the Backyard Professor Chess Videos. I've got a really interesting Bobby Fischer game this time where he plays the King Indian's Attack. He's white and he's playing a man named Seedman. So let's see what these guys do. You know what I love about doing all of these Bobby Fischer games is because we get him from his youth and we see the moves that he makes and we see how he develops his powers. He makes several dubious moves in some of his uh, games and through the years he corrected those and as we go through these we also can see how to correct our moves and how to do correct moves and how to implement really good strategies. Notice he's castling early here. This is this is typical of good chess, I promise. And now here we come into the center. Fisher is going to prepare to get into the center. Anyway, like I was saying, I love going through these games because it will elevate us as we see how Bobby Fischer got stronger and stronger and stronger. And we will see how he changes his use of several of his pieces at different times in the game through the years as he grew and matured. So that's kind of fun. Here, Seedman is truly occupying the center with the pawns. So, so this is going to be a uh, this is going to be a strong game. They have approached the line of demarcation. Let's see what happens from here. Fisher has prepared, and now he does not leave the center uncontested. You never do. Not ever. Seedman allows the tension to remain. He continues to bring out more pieces. It's okay to allow the tension to remain and bring out more pieces to a degree. And Fisher likewise doesn't bother about the tension at this point. Bring out another piece, yes. And now Seedman continues to let the pressure reside and he castles. Very excellent. And so does Fisher. Fisher is just continuing. The theme in development is try to put your pieces on better and better squares that improves their power, right? And that is what we're witnessing here. And now the tension is released at this point in this particular center setup. So we are to the point to where now Bring another piece, absolutely. Bring another piece in this. Fisher is going to prepare to bring his queen out on the wing. Very interesting. And solidify the center pawn. Now I call this a center pawn. It's influencing a central square. Technically, it's not a central pawn. But it has to do with the center. There's no question about that. Queen to e2, and now a5, here he comes. Now, the two center pawns are butting heads, sure. Uh, and there's not a lot of uh, traffic flow through the center. There's not a lot of threats through the center. And so Seedman feels like a wing attack is going to work. And so he begins the wing, and Fisher will meet him on the a file, for sure. And now here comes the bishop. Tickling the queen, pointing toward the king's side, the castled king's side, tickling the queen. Now this is really cool how Fisher reacts. And, and I've said, you know, in the past, try not to react to your opponent uh, as a completely typical reaction but you have to react to your opponent at times, right? Notice, though, how Fisher handles this. He does not make a passive queen move. Instead, he puts his knight on c4. Now, see, strategically, tactically, you want to avoid pins. 
Here, Fisher deliberately pins his knight to his queen. That is so interesting. But also, that c4 square, that's a pretty good square. Perhaps there's more to this move than we think. And in fact, Seedman fell for the sucker punch. He proceeds forward. This is just not the best way at all. This is a, a bad mistake. Why would that be for this reason? I will point this out right now. There is no pawns on either side to challenge that knight. And on c4, that is a great place for the knight. Now it's going to take an exchange of pieces to get Fisher's knight off that square. That's very interesting to observe, right? That's a great post. Fisher played this quite nice. Now, Fisher drops his feeding kiddoed bishop back because it gives support to his queen, which the knight is pinned to. Okay? So, again, the he did feeding keto. These two are locked pretty hard for the time being, right? So, the bishop here, it is developed, but don't settle just to have developed pieces. Put them to better squares if there is a possibility. And I love witnessing what Fisher was thinking here. We're going to see something really cool here in the next few moves. And this is the beginning of the maneuver. This is fun. It's great to learn how to play great chess. Rook to A, from A to D. Hey, there's a central file. Take it. Yeah. Yeah, develop the piece and get a great file. That's a good piece of real estate without question. Now, what does Fisher do? He bumps his queen over so that the bishop is supporting this. In other words, he effectively breaks the pin because now it's a piece of equal value that is pinned, right? Now, remarkably, Fisher does not fight for that central file. I mean, in, previous, in fact, in the previous two Fisher videos, uh, both players fought like cats and dogs over the central files. And in fact, in one game, they changed off all of their rooks. It's better to trade off all of your rooks rather than let your opponent have an open file. So why isn't Bobby doing that this time? He's letting him have the file. Let's keep playing and I'll show you another remarkable, excellent strategy on open files. Very cool how this works out. Knight coming up to g4. Now this also is quite interesting because Fisher's Castle King now has two pawns that have moved forward. And the, th the theme is, if at all possible, try to keep your pawns against your king. Don't. The more you move forward the pawns, the weaker the castle position gets. For instance, because now he did push this pawn to Fee and Keto, the bishop, yeah? That was part of the opening. But that does not eliminate the weakness. Now look, because this pawn is pushed forward, this square is weak. That knight is unsupported. Did you notice that? That's, that's pretty important. So, Fisher bumping up another pawn. Yes, it's creating a few weaknesses. Are they going to be in play? Not right now, but he did put the knight back. Okay? Okay, so... We're getting some interesting nuance here that is going to be really fun to look at. Now, what did I say? I just said the, the weak square with the knight on it, uh, and now Fisher moves the knight, the piece that did not have support. This is such a cool little micro lesson. He always wants his pieces to be supported, if not double supported. Every one of them. 
Now here the queen is not supported. Did you notice that? You want to pay attention to stuff like that. That's really important. So, so this is getting real interesting. And now, rook f to e8, that's, you know, that's a dubious move. That doesn't do a lot of good. And now Fisher, in like terms, <laughs> plays another dubious move. <sighs> Let's take a look at this. Rather than this particular move, which, I mean, the pawn is supported, so this one is supported, double supported. So what, you know, that doesn't do a lot, right? What if he had instead put the knight right there? Very interesting, right? Yeah, notice what this does. If he takes with that, then Fisher gets the bishop pair. And of course, pinning the knight, the rook could move over here somewhere, probably here, and the bishop could move back. But that would have been a much better move, a much better strategic uh, exchange of pieces had Fisher done that. But he didn't. He is only mortal and human, so two dubious moves in a row. And now, interestingly, because of the way uh, both Seidman and Fisher moved, now he comes back to here with the queen. And if you're asking yourself, all right, but wait a minute, that's just one square move, can't he now go ahead and do this, and this, and this. He can, but now unfortunately that takes place, and that's a wicked breakthrough. So see, just the subtlety of moving the queen back one square takes away that advantageous exchange that Fisher had just one move before. So you got to watch the board carefully on items like that, don't you? It's very important to keep your head up and pay attention to details. So rather than falling for doing that series of moves, Fisher does the excellent move of the king. Yeah, and he got an exclamation point on that. Move. So this is superb. The Fisher's doing this correctly is, is what I am trying to tell you. So we're happy and we don't clap our hands. The queen comes to e6 now. Now Fisher attacks the pawn. And of course, the knight will take the knight. And, of course, the knight will take the knight. So we've clarified this wing more or less, right? Understanding that really the center is still locked more or less. But wait, there is an open file. And what is Bobby doing ignoring that open file? Here's the other item I wanted to tell you that I was hinting at a few minutes ago. One good strategy, if the board position calls for it, is to swap the rooks. Because seriously, Bobby knows he doesn't want to give his opponent that open file. He's well aware of this. And... Yet, he's not fighting for it. Observe Bobby's position in relation to this open file, however. This square is unavailable. 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 The majority of this file is useless. So, why expend the effort to fight him for it 
when he can't use it anyway, that means that rook is not being as effective as it could be doing something else. So there's the other alternate strategy when your opponent gets an open file. In this instance, it is more advantageous to keep your rooks. It really would be a bad thing if Bobby started throwing his rooks out here and swapping those rooks. He's better off with his rooks at this point. That's a fascinating thing to observe the strategy of taking away the effectiveness of that square. I mean, he could go here, but that's a complete waste of time, right? Very cool to see this, isn't it? So now we've learned a couple of different ways to deal with open files with rooks. Now, this is what chess is all about. This, this is what makes it so dadgum much fun. Now, after this, the bishop takes the bishop. Okay. And the rook takes the bishop. Okay. Pressing the pawn. It's the isolated pawn. And he, he proceeds to press it. Yeah, okay. All right, he pressed the pawn. Not a big deal, but notice where Bobby's putting his queen. He just wants to make sure he maintains contact with the pawn, right? He's got contact. The queen is okay here, but let's be realistic. This pawn ain't moving anytime soon. And this diagonal is truly just cut in half. So is she doing, is that the best square for your most powerful piece? No, of course not. So bring it out. Bring it over. Improve the position. This is what we're seeing Bobby do. And now all of a sudden when you, when you have that in your mind, you recognize, you know, some of these little moves that occur are for a purpose. Bobby never made any superfluous moves in his life if he could at all help it, and neither should we. So, so this is a great little lesson. Let's keep watching to see what happens. And I understand the psychology here because I've been trying to express it somewhat. Look what Seedman does now. Kablam! No, there is no kablam. Uh, and I mean the psychology. I've got this file. It's impressive to have an open file. I've got an unopposed rook. I really need to use it. And now that I press my pawn, I've got a safe square to put that rook. But to what end? There's no real target anywhere. Right? So, what? <laughs> he would have been better off pinning that knight to his rook. That would have been the better way. See, but and, and this is why, you know, every position uh, we have to evaluate and, and judge it on its merits because one rule in one particular game would have said maintain that uh, open file. In this case, the better move was to forget the file, pin the knight to the rook. But he didn't. He came to here. So let's see what comes of this. We're in for a real interesting situation coming up right now. Target. Bobby acquires a target. Now, his work hasn't developed. His bishop hasn't developed. Technically, Bobby is behind in development. That can be disastrous in some respects, in fact, in most respects. So why not develop and also acquire a target with that pawn? That's nice because that pawn is given that rook as support. Now that's good. That's good chess. So rook e to d8. Now you're saying, okay, okay, what do you do with an open file? Man, if you can double your rooks, it's much more powerful. So Seedman is doing things as best he can to get the good use out of that central open file. Double the rooks. Okay, so 
Let's take a look here. That's getting pretty good. And of course, the pond falls. Yeah, we saw that coming the moment Bobby pushed this. So now what? Okay, Bobby has a file. We have to be careful. There's no back rank mate threat with Bobby's King, but there is with Seedman. So bump yourself an opening. You always have to keep track of those back rank potential checkmates. Even if they're one or two moves away, keep track of them and do something. Prepare yourself right now while you can. Technically, he's not under siege. Open himself an escape hatch. The other theme is there really is not a whole lot over here to do. <laughs> Understatement of the video, yeah. So, and, and technically, the center is locked. So, that's about the only place you can play. So that's interesting too, right? Now, Rook to E1. Notice he still isn't challenging the file. What is going on here? Let's keep watching. This really gets interesting. Bishop C5. King comes to G2. Give it extra support of the F pawn, maintaining the support on the H pawn, and get your king closer to the center. We are in the middle game, but in the end game, you want the king toward the center. I've said that almost every video because that is what the great players do. So, that's a nice move. And you say, well, it doesn't accomplish it. You bet it did. I just elaborated on what it accomplished. It, keep, it maintains support. It also helps double support. And it brings him one square close to the center. That is a great move. Yes, 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 yes. And here comes Seedman. Now, okay, uh, potential pawn storm on the wing, right? On the wing, what's the point when... Your opponent begins to attack on the wing if you come at all do it. Center. And we see Bobby go to the center. Very, very interesting. Hey, the C4 is a great square, but it served its purpose. If there's a better place to put your knight, you have to find that and get there. Don't just leave your piece there because, hey, it's on a great square. Look how empty this side is. So really, the greatness of the square has served its purpose. Get it to a better spot. Great little lesson here. I love how Bobby does this. Queen d7. Now look. <laughs> Sincerely, Seidman is doing everything humanly possible to make that central file very powerful and intimidating. This is almost an Alakin gun, isn't it? Remember the famous Alakin gun that he threw on Nemzovich? Um, now, you've got three of your major powers on a file. Now, can you get something done with this? So far, the file has been truly ineffective. Now you've got your three main pieces on it. This is so remarkable. What does Bobby do? Does he freak out and begin trying to fight for that central file? No, he finds a target. The one piece that is unsupported, the bishop. <laughs> so Bobby attacks it. See, the impression we're getting here, uh, Seedman just can't quite seem to coordinate it all together, can he? He's doing a good job getting there. This is pretty good. I mean, I'm not trying to discredit him, but what's this bishop doing out here in the middle of nowhere with absolutely no support? There's your target. Attack it. Not only that, but he's x-raying the bishop to a central pawn. Observe that. So, and you go, see, he's now attacking Bobby. True. So Bobby comes to here. 
keep keep attacking the bishop. It's an undefended piece, man. Right? <laughs> Truly. This is almost it's almost humorous. That's why I'm giggling. Look at the effect though, man. So he had his three major powers on this central file, and he still can't get anything out of it. He is not forced to bring his power piece over here to defend the undefended piece. And so now Bobby says, okay, good, mission accomplished. <laughs> Let's come back home. Now the queen immediately goes back. So is now the time to begin to freak out about that central file? No, it's not. Watch what Bobby does. Now you say, wait a minute. He just pulled the knight off of C4 to come down here to find greener pastures because this whole side's empty. It's not now. He's harassing the heck out of that bishop. But there is larger picture to look at. Can you see what Bobby might be thinking? This gets very cool. This gets very subtle. And now Seedman blunders. I've got to guard my unprotected piece. Well, there's nowhere to go where it can be safe, so I'm going to zap the pawn blunder. Absolutely horrible. So the queen will take the bishop. Now, can Seedman see the problem coming up? That's the million dollar question. And he misses it. He misses it. Knight h5. Can you see what Bobby needs to do? Yeah, the knights are tricky pieces, man. Look at that fork on the queen and the rook. Ouch! I mean, Seedman had to have done one of these. <laughs> Truly, that is fabulous. You always got to pay attention, man, when, when the knights are out. You really have to look careful at what squares they can influence. Um, he just missed that. Doggone it! So, the, here's the other interesting thing about this. The queen really has no effective place to go, does she? She's passive. The fascinating thing is, it's on the open file with the three most powerful pieces, and yet the queen has no place to go. It's almost like she has no actual function. Is that not astonishing? That's astonishing, you guys. Seriously. So he gets the rook. What Bobby did essentially is he won the exchange, right? He won the exchange. So now, okay, you've won the exchange. Don't start playing passive. Now you attack. So, and while it is true that this rook has been guarding that pawn, you can improve his position once more, and Bobby does so majestically. Improve the position, yes. Now look at this psychology of Seedman. This next move is also really instructive. He's got the open file. He knows files are used as highways into the territory to attack. Let's get an attack going. He comes to here, and he pins the bishop to the rook. Oh. And he falls into the next beautiful tactic of Fisher, who comes to here. Another fork of the knight and the rook, man. Ouch! 
Well, the pin is in place, right? It does limit the effectiveness of the rook coming up here and starting to cause havoc. So keep the rook there. Support the rook. But after looking at it, he's two pieces up. Fisher is. So it was here that Seedman resigned. Uh, now, now this game is just fantastically instructive. And yes, I probably overemphasize the open file. I get excited about open files because they work so well. So it's excellent to also know how to defend against them. And this game is a fantastic illustration. Not only can you exchange rooks, but look how Bobby benefited by just virtually almost ignoring that file the whole game. Isn't that amazing? That's because he neutralized it. He neutralized it. And these pawns never moved. He kept the file neutralized throughout the game. That's nice to see that. And then, of course, using tactics, he won the game. So, wonderful win by Bobby Fischer. Fun game as an illustration for us. Aha, we've learned yet again something really good, useful, and new for our own chess information. An ability to improve our games. Thank you to Bobby Fischer. So. All right, you guys, thank you for watching my Backyard Professor chess videos. You guys have a fantastic day. Be good, do well, have fun, make lots of friends, and I will see you in the next Backyard Professor chess video. Yes, mm. we've got a lot more excellent Fisher games to talk about.